All right, welcome back everybody to Cool's Reviews. It's uh, been a while since we've checked out a uh, documentary featuring live action hosts and prehistoric monsters. I know we previously did Nigel Marvin's uh, Chase by Dinosaurs and Chase by Sea Monsters special, which we enjoyed. Uh, so today we're checking out a 2003, uh, I guess, documentary-ish uh, film, Jeff Corwin's giant monsters uh for those of you that might not know or definitely those of you who are younger audience chef corwin uh, was pretty big about the same time steve Irwin was uh he goes around trying to teach people about animals and we'll we'll kind of talk more about that going into that but as usual my name is keegan joining me today is matt sam so i i do remember the jeff corwin experience and i actually do remember actually watching this one at my great grandma's house in denver colorado uh but i wanted to see about the team members if they remember jeff corwin at all so matt we'll start with you matt no i do don't remember him at all man and what about you sam i do not i didn't watch him at all yeah to be fair i didn't watch i was definitely more of the steve Irwin guy watched a ton of the crocodile hunter stuff uh me and my buddy nathan would go around trying to find little animals and the whole group of us love animals. I think that's why you see so much different animal content on our channel. We go to different zoos or wildlife sanctuaries, and who knows, maybe next summer we'll get out and try to showcase some of Colorado's animals because we're pretty lucky to see some of the animals we do have here. Matt, what is your takeaway with this episode? How do you feel about it before we dive into some of the animals they showcased? I mean, it presented some interesting facts. I mean, it was uh, neat to see, but I think it was geared towards a, uh, like preteen age group. Um, he definitely has more like that little bit of a kitty voice in him where it's not, you know, the educational type, you know, what you watch with like a Morgan Freeman or, you know, Samuel Jackson, like hosting type thing. He just, uh, came across a little kitty for me. So, um, it was kind of hard to get into it, but you know what? I did take away was informational. And Sam, what about you? I mean, I honestly thought <laughs> it was someone else trying to do like what Nigel does, but in a more not as fun way, in a way. No, I get what you mean. Because like I said, we did do our Chase by Dinosaurs one uh, where Nigel goes back into the past and sees all these animals. This one definitely had more of a conservation spin as far as the animals you see tie into some modern creatures and you learn, like Matt said, more information about those modern creatures. Now, Matt, was there a living creature that you really enjoyed seeing on this episode? Uh, you know me, ever since we went to the uh, Colorado Gator Farm, I have a, a new kind of passion for alligators and crocodiles and uh, quite fascinated with them on how, you know, they almost just not too long ago became an extinct animal. And, you know, uh, we've been able to rejuvenate that population to where I think they said it was like for every 15 humans, there's one crocodile now. So um, that was kind of interesting to learn. But uh, definitely um, digging the alligators and crocodiles right now. And Sam, what about you? Living animals, which one uh, did you enjoy the most? I also agree with Matt, but also like the Komodo dragons was another one with the mega neuro but gotta love them sarcos yeah we'll definitely get in sarcos Zucas later i'm trying to remember when i watched this i mean i the bearded or the not the beard i have a bearded dragon uh the collar lizard uh was always neat for me when i was a kid uh, especially when they get up and run um one of my favorite animals growing up was a uh, mountain lion as well so always kind of cool to see those and photo panthers are just mountain lions that live in florida so pretty pretty interesting stuff there's a hockey team as well uh he was not searching for the hockey team this time but the actual animal now matt prehistoric animals are you on the same boat crocodiles or was there a different prehistoric animal that you enjoyed i kind of uh, didn't really know that there was a giant sloth like uh creature way back when that you know took a 40 pound shit that's that's crazy um Mega also, Nero. Yeah. Yeah, Megatherium. And then of course the saber tooth uh tiger. Always, you know, just from uh 
you know, Power Rangers and stuff like that at my younger age is when I learned about saber tooth tigers and stuff. So uh, always fascinated to learn a little bit more about that. Mega Nira is the dragonfly. Mega Nira, yeah. So it, it's all big names. I learned that. Mega Megalania is Megalania is the lizard. That's not Every, all. I said it right the first yeah. time, and I'm just fucking all up. There's Everything was like called that. back then, like Mega or Giant or whatever. They they had a nickname for everything with either the word Mega or Giant in it. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll get into because obviously this is what 20 years old this year right because it was made in 2003 and we're watching this in 2023 so this is 20 years old it's insane we're old now uh sam what about you uh prehistoric animal which one did you enjoy seeing the most probably the megalania i'll say it correctly this time (laughs) yeah i will say i remember watching this one obviously tyrannosaurus rex is super cool always fun to see uh, but I remember as a kid, I was disappointed that Megalania had such a small part in this episode. Uh, I felt like a, some of the other ones had bigger parts, especially like uh, Megarachne, which we'll get to. And uh, the Smilodon slash Megatherium ones, kind of big, but they are two different ones, so it makes sense. But yeah, I, I wish uh, Megalania would have uh, had a little bit more of time. Now, this is where it's going to be fun, because I want to know if you guys learned anything, and then we'll see if it's still true 20 years later. Uh, If we've learned anything since these discoveries to kind of shape how we now know about these animals. So, Matt, we'll start with you. Now, I really, like I said, I I haven't seen it before, but um, almost everything I took in today was new and something that I learned, you know. Um, One thing I did know, or I learned probably not 20 years ago, but uh, when you're in a chase with a crocodile to run kind of zigzag patterns because it throws off their like equilibrium and they can't quite catch it in. But um, I also sure. didn't know, I always thought that all cat-like creatures could climb trees and be super fast, mm-hmm. but to learn that the, what was the smiling? Smilodon. Uh, Smilodon was not a fast cat and it also did not do well climbing trees. So that was kind of interesting to learn. I still don't know if I would... Uh, want to climb a tree if a big cat were following chasing you, you. now did you uh did you enjoy his sacrifice during the croc chase where he pushed his caddy out <laughs> yeah that was kind of funny but um yeah no, it was cool now sam same with you uh anything that you took away from this one i mean there was some things but most of it i kind of already knew from conversations with you and trips to the zoo (laughs) so there wasn't like there was like a couple things that were a little a little new but like probably not accurate yeah other than that it was still it was decent not saying it's bad even though nigel is uh i like his approach more he doesn't bring it back to real world That's all I'm going to say, because we haven't watched Prehistoric Park yet. Just wait. With Nigel Marvin. Mm. <laughs> now I know we got to watch that one. Um, <laughs> I was trying to, when, when we watched, or yeah, when we watched this, I was trying to count how many times he died. Because he dies quite a bit in this episode. Uh, yeah. The Tyrannosaurus doesn't kill him. I th- what was the uh, Sarcosuchus was the first kill. Just like comes up uh, and bites his head off. Yeah, the best kill was the um, spider, you know. So, but, you know, out of all the kills, I think the Arachnia one looked kind of the most somewhat realistic, you know. Yeah. Well, I guess we will start there with Mega Arachne. Uh, good thing for everyone that's afraid of spiders. It was not a giant spider. Uh, I know at the time of discovery, for a long time, even if you tra- uh, went to the Denver Museum, because that's the museum that's obviously in our home state, uh, they have a Maragarachne specimen there. It was labeled as a giant spider, but today we do know it as a Eurypterid, uh, which were giant sea scorpions, and this was actually a small sea scorpion. It wasn't one of the big ones because they could get pretty big. Uh, but yeah, that's so if you're afraid of spiders, good news. There's not a giant two foot wide spider crawling around packing a punch. So that's definitely one of the 
uh, things that we've learned in the 20 years. And I think that's why it's always fun looking back at old documentaries and seeing just how far we've come. Matt, do you feel safer knowing there wasn't a giant two-foot spider? No, because he showed me that bird-eating spider, and that one gave me a new nightmare now. You know, I didn't think he got much bigger than those uh, camel spiders or whatever you call them that they have out there in Iraq. Um, but, yeah, I've seen that bird-eating spider. Uh, I've got a new fear now. <laughs> it was a big one. Like, obviously, it was pregnant, but it was fatty. Like, it was yeah. big. And he was just, like, laying right next to it. Yeah, that, that would have me going, nope, and running the other direction. Not walking, running the other direction. <laughs> right. Yeah, so not a lot to cover with the that one outside of it's now Eurypterid. Uh, I think we'll go back to uh, Megalania now, which was one that Sam talked about. Don't worry, guys. It's still out there. Megalania is still valid. Uh, the difference is they've realized it is so closely related to the modern, like, Komodo dragons and, like, monitor lizards. Its scientific name is no longer Megalania, but Varanus, just like the Komodo dragon. So while people, that's one difference people still call it, still its common name is Megalania. But one weird thing in here is it does kind of stay, it's set about 20 feet long, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, Which I think is, that was the, it wasn't that the biggest one that they've ever, I think, yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds right, 20 feet. Yeah, which is really kind of uh, reserved for when this came out. Uh, back in the day, they used to be kind of quoted at 30 feet long. Um, today, with more better understanding of where it falls in line with like Komodo dragons and stuff, 15 to 20 feet is more accurate. Though the model looks more like it's a 40 foot long lizard. Well, how about those guys down in Florida just the other day? I think they captured like a 14-foot-long alligator. Alligator, was, yeah. It was over 800, 900 pounds. Like, dang, that was a big alligator. Big, big one. Yeah. I was trying to think. Not a lot happened with me. I'm just disappointed. I wish I had more time. There's actually a book, and maybe at some point I will review it. It's all about Megalania. Uh, we don't have a lot of documentaries on it so maybe we'll try to do our own one day uh, we have to actually go to where they have specimens so we can show you but yeah one day uh, we i know sam enjoys megalania i enjoy megalania and we got mm -hmm. komodo dragons here so i mean we could always show you guys those yeah i'd be definitely interested in that because there really isn't that much about the megalanias mm -mm. and they're really interesting they actually lived at a really interesting time where there was also 20 foot long land crocodiles in Australia at this time. It's just a really intriguing time. Australia has always kind of been intriguing because of how long ago it broke off from Pangaea. Um, it's been able to actually have all this evolution on its own. So definitely something we'll probably get into in the future. Uh, so not a huge change with Megalania there, like Megarachne. So we'll jump back to another pretty big change one, and that's Sarcosuchus. Now, Sarcosuchus still valid. There is two different species, one that lived in Africa, which is usually the one people refer to. We've seen Nigel Marvin uh, showcase it, though he was talking about the Brazil one because uh, they were showing Patagonia uh, with Giganotosaurus and stuff like that. Now, what's come out since... No, it's not good yet. Uh, oh. what, now, what's come out in the 20 years is how we estimate the size of these giant... That's one thing. Sarcosuchus is not a true crocodile. It's very closely related to them. It's not like Dinosuchus, where Dinosuchus Lake Cretaceous is an alligator, like a prehistoric crocodilian. I know often it's called super croc and stuff like that, but it's not a true crocodilian. So they are actually a crocodile form. So they are distant relatives of what we have today. Now, we don't have full skeletons of these guys. We do have quite a bit of material. And especially with the skull, it helps us uh, determine the size of these prehistoric animals but how we determine it has changed and here they were kind of showing you the length of the skull gave you the whole length of the animal 
but currently we now do a little bit better measurement where it's the width of the head because what they found is length of skulls didn't really showcase how long living crocodiles were in different living specimens. But if they did it by the width of the skull, it gave you better proportions. So it's no longer 40 feet long. It's more like 29 to 30, maybe 33 feet long. So still super big, but smaller than some of the other actual true crocodilians that lived in the past, like Dinosuchus, who lived in uh, good old USA, uh, where we are. We're not too far away from where a Dinosuchus is displayed, so maybe we can go check that out sometime. As far as the Sarcosuchus in the 20 years, outside of its size... I mean, besides the Dunkleosis is a uh, hoax size change. Yeah, Dunkleosis is a very interesting new uh, size estimate of like 13 feet long. It looks like a tadpole on steroids. Some, some science person's playing a joke on the community with that size. <laughs> He's just making that up. There was a uh, picture where it was like Spinosaurus was all sad because he's like, they never know my true form. And Dunkleosius is like, you're lucky. <laughs> Just like showed it like as a tadpole. And he's like, oh yeah, I'll take this. <laughs> Another one that they talked about will kind of go to not a whole lot of inaccuracy. I mean, they talked about Smilodon and Megatherium. Both these guys were South American animals. Though we did have both uh, types of animals we did, did have giant ground sloths and saber-toothed cats in america but these gianter ones these bigger specimens were known from south america they came over in a land exchange so yeah i mean not not too much that we've and as far as i know i guess i'm not super in depth in saber-toothed cats either uh, we do know that Smilodon's the largest feline though so that's something kind of fun uh, Megatherium's definitely the giant biggest sloth. And uh, yeah, you probably won't want to mess with it. We saw Mr. Corwin get a little close, get some scratches into the trees. What What are you laughing at? What are you laughing at? Yeah, are close with a lot of them. I mean, he technically got killed by the spiders twice. Twice, yeah. He had like the dream sequence where he was like, just like digested and then a whole group of them were just like <laughs> and then Smilodon I guess he didn't get super close because he was like he thought it was like a uh, a Florida Panther but then yeah he got way too close to that Megatherium it was just like, and that T-Rex probably would have seen him too because it was mm -hmm. like on his side of the truck when it was like nudging it Yep. So should should we talk about the the T Rex in the room? Sure. Matt, did they do your T Rex dirty in this one? <clears throat> I think so. Um, given the, I mean, I don't know. It, being that it was twenty years ago, and maybe the CGI is where it should have been. It definitely was no Jurassic Park T Rex, so. though. It was almost like a cross between the land before time and uh, Jurassic Park combination, you know? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, <clears throat> this was 20 years ago, which was the right time for a pretty heated debate. Uh, something that is even more debated than our comment sections where you guys debate dinosaur lips. And that is, was T-Rex a scavenger? And back in the early 2000s, there was some pretty notable scientists that were pushing this idea that Tyrannosaurus was a pure scavenger, which is what this uh, documentary shows. Obviously, uh, especially in Colorado, in the Denver Museum, we have a specimen of Edmontosaurus that Kenneth Carpenter, you'll see in documentaries, shows uh, healed a bite mark from a Tyrannosaurus. We have other Hadrosaurs and Triceratops. Uh, that have healed bite marks. So obviously, if you're being a scavenge, you're not going to heal. And it's kind of hard to imagine a 9 to 10 ton predator. Yes, that's right. Transverse is actually bigger than this documentary shows. They kind of said about 12,000 pounds, which is about 6 tons. We now know with more modern estimates about 9 tons for Sue or Scotty, maybe 
Scotty pushing that 10 ton mark. So yeah, definitely an interesting time shows its uh, age for sure with T Rex, and I'm sure a lot of people are gonna gonna comment on that one. Uh, let's see, they talked about Quetzalcoatlus. Yeah, I forgot the lit. The what? Lit. They forgot the lips on the dinosaur, as they um, always do. I'm sure people are gonna be more upset about the scavenging T Rex than. <laughs> that's a that's a whole nother. Tyrannosaurus was probably an opportunist like most land predators today, right? Where they actually will hunt their prey, but hey, if you find a free meal, what are you going to do? You're going to eat it because it saves energy. I mean, most carnivores, like if they found a free meal, they would scavenge it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And T-Rex had super good eyesight from recent studies. It does have really good bite force, uh, super good sense of smell, which is obviously the leading idea of why they were a scavenger in this one which other animals that aren't scavengers also have really good sense of smell so the uh spino again you would actually win you can outsmart it i mean they probably just would not fight in real life they probably would not yeah mo most predators when they come to a fight will try to just discourage each other from fighting by mm -hmm. body body language and sounds so a real fight between a trans source and spine source would probably be anticlimactic because one's mainly in the rivers one's on land not really going after the same prey and so they'd probably just transverse would see another large predator and spinosaurus would turn to its side show its huge cell and they just decide hey let's not fight today super anticlimactic mm. jurassic park 3 would be very different <laughs> what's a quat list they talked about uh, skimming feed, obviously, probably not what it was doing. Probably would break its uh, beak. As darkids were probably large carnivores of smaller dinosaurs, smaller animals. Especially if you look at Hatsagopteryx, probably the largest terrestrial predator of Hatsag Island at the time. So Quetzalcoatlus was probably actually going around eating baby dinosaurs maybe scavenging from time to time um maybe smaller animals probably not skim feeding though he's still on the megalania one where he's showing like the skull next to the cage of it oh the komodo dragon one yeah see and that's another thing look at the skull of that komodo dragon and then look at what a komodo dragon looks like it if you look at dinosaurs and their schools but their teeth protruding and people are like there's no animals today look at that komodo dragon its mm -hmm. teeth are protruding pretty well on that skull and we don't see them when their mouth shut yeah they they show a giant squid uh, very, very briefly here and it kills him as well so it's the very last one i do think that's kind of the cool part because like matt said this is aged towards younger audiences but it's showing, hey, while well, these prehistoric animals are gone, we still have some of their living descendants or similar types of animals. Maybe not direct descendants or even closely related, but animals that can remind us of these prehistoric ones living today that do need our help. And I think it's always good to help spread the message of conservation. You know, it's something that we we like to do as well. We want to help these animals survive. A lot of these guys they showcased in this video are pretty low in numbers worldwide yeah except for spiders man yeah. spiders are everywhere they're they're creepy crawly everywhere and there's plenty of people who have like a thousand of them living in their house that show them off <laughs> well and this yeah like the guy in the video <laughs> yeah well, no, uh -huh. there's a guy i uh watch on tiktok live every now and then he's got he's over like 300 species of spiders now and he shows them and talks about them and I mean, they're cool to see, but that's about as close to one I'm going to want to see as, uh, you know, over social media or something. You said mm -hmm. when we go to the Butterfly Pavilion, you're not holding Rosie? Um, I, I may. My hand will be criminal. Rosie, Rosie, Rosie may get um, shaken spider syndrome or something. <laughs> I've held Rosie. No, Rose, well, Rosie's still alive in the sense that it's probably like Rosie number 14, but. Uh, Probably more yeah, than that. They, Rosie oh, yeah, they still have a Rosie. There's no way. <laughs> There's no way. I just don't think they have the heart to tell the kids Rosie died and this is a new spider, you know? 
<laughs> True. Rosie's like the forever name. I, I think it'd be cool to kind of give spiders different names and let kids know, yeah, well, your typical tarantula lives maybe two years in captivity. I know they live a little bit longer, but, you know, with being handed off all the time, that might create stress. Like, teach the kids the real stuff, you know. That might be more helpful. Mm-hmm. And then, like, give somebody an opportunity to name a new spider, you know, like fuzzy or furry or whatever, you know. See, what's kind of funny about this whole little little bit is you were the one that showcased the tarantula parade here in Colorado, Matt. Yep. I, like I said, uh, let's let's do it, but <laughs> I won't be holding them. Just from a distance. Yeah, so yeah. Colorado uh, has the yearly parade of tarantulas on their mating route. They travel. Uh, so it's southern Colorado, uh, something thousands of spiders. Like people will go down and uh, check out these tarantulas. I actually got to see one in Canyon City, not the parade, but just a lone tarantula in the wild. I know colored lizards big in Arizona. Um, something we'd like to go do. We haven't really done many videos from Arizona, even though we've been to Arizona. Um, so that's something maybe one day we can get out to. Panthers, we have mountain lions in Colorado. Uh, you guys really enjoyed the short we did about that mountain lion at the Shine Mountain Zoo, which is really kind of a cool exhibit because they will sit right on top of the glass, which is right above you. It's kind of cool. They just, they're really up close. You can see them walking around and it's pretty cool. Uh, no giant squids, so we won't we won't be doing that. Uh, we've seen vultures. We have had a couple of videos of vultures on the channel, thanks to Nature's Educators and some of the performances we have seen with them. It's one of the older documentaries we have watched, as far as like paleontology, I suppose. I know that Giganotosaurus one was older, but not by a whole whole lot. So we'll uh, kind of go into final thoughts before we go into ratings. So Matt, what's your final thought on this documentary? Yeah, I mean, like I said, there was a lot of information to be passed on. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if they really did way back when call these animals, you know, megas and giants and all these fancy names we have for them now with, with these scientific names, you know. Um, I don't see any quave, cave dwelling drawings of, you know, when these creatures supposedly existed carved in stone, you know? <laughs> well, not a lot of these existed at that time, luckily for people, but there is a pretty cool location, La Brea in California, the tar pits where there, it was a predator trap, obviously, because there's tons of predators. There's super two cats. There's these dire wolves. There's plenty of other animals. There's mammoths and stuff like that because they were tar pits, oil, stuff like that. And they prey would go and get stuck, and then the predators would come, think it's an easy meal, and get stuck. So at some point, it's a location we definitely want to check out, talk about. Sam, what about you? Final thoughts on this documentary? I mean, I definitely thought it was decent for what it is, and um, it can be informative, even though, like, a lot of it, or at least the the spider one was kind of inaccurate and there is some slight inaccurate throughout it. It still has like some good information in there. So it's not bad, but walking with dinosaurs is a lot better. No. Yeah. If we're comparing, obviously BBC had a little bit bigger of a budget than animal planet for their chase by dinosaurs. And they had the team behind walking with dinosaurs making that. And yeah, different, Definitely different shows. It makes me kind of want to watch um, The Lost World because it's the same graphics team that helped make the dinosaurs and like Walking with Dinosaurs and Chased by Dinosaurs for the BBC Lost World series. So that'll be something we'll have to cover at some point in the future. Uh, this one's definitely pretty nostalgic for me watching it. I, uh, I remember watching this as a kid. I haven't watched it in years and I found on Google or not Google, YouTube not too long ago and i was like oh one day we're gonna have to cover that and today's the day so matt final final ratings recommendations what do you say i mean if you're in that younger age age range um or if you want to just learn some different stuff i mean it might be good worth checking it out um it wasn't really my cup of tea like i said the guy had too much of a you know um an age down type demeanor, like um, he was speaking to that younger generation. So 
for me, it would probably be like a seven, maybe six and a half. But um, yeah, definitely, if you want to learn some stuff about some of the uh, animals that have been around forever, or have ancestors that have been around, it's worth checking out. Okay. Sam, what about you? Like Matt said, it was definitely for a younger generation. So I'd probably give it like a five. But like, I would still, if you have kids, recommend it. Like, have them check it out. Right. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. He dies a lot in it. So I'm not actually sure if it's smart to do that. He, he dies not more than Nigel. Day. Yeah, Nigel died like one time. Yeah, no, see, no, we definitely go watch Prehistoric Park, though. Well, actually, technically, we didn't see him die. So oh, no, he... a lot, you have to do the video game theory, whereas, like, if you don't actually physically see that character die, they probably didn't. No, but he, it does, at the end of the first one, it does say, kind of lead you to believe the Sarkasukas ate him. And then the Mosasaurs and the Chase by Sea Monsters, where there's just like hundreds of them coming out the boat. <laughs> just like warming the boat. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I would probably say nostalgia, six out of 10 for me, for sure. There's definitely a lot of inaccuracies. And like they've said, it's made for younger, uh, younger demographic. Uh, than what we are now but for me kind of nostalgic because i do actually remember watching this as a kid so it's it's still kind of fun um it was a different one to watch and i'm glad we talked about it kind of different than what we usually watch so it's it's always good to kind of mix up what we do now uh, the time it was filmed was in all this stuff uh considered inaccurate or was it accurate at the time but as we progressed over the last 20 years, we've just gained a better knowledge. I would say most of it would have been accurate. The Tyrannosaurus stuff was highly controversial. That was like a huge debate. And I have some older dinosaur docs we could watch at some point where they're just like, this is brought up all the time. Like today, obviously, it's not brought up because it's just kind of a silly thing. But yeah, that's probably the only one that would have been seen controversially at the time was these, the scavenger theory with Tyrannosaurus. The rest of them, I would say, was as accurate as we could be with what we had at the time. And that's the fun. One day we'll watch, like, I'll try to find, like, the oldest documentary we can watch and just be like, this is, like, I don't even know what they're talking about. Right. Some from, like, the 1940s, just like, yeah, they're, no. What is this? But yeah, that is uh, Jeff Corrin's Giant Monsters. Not Godzilla Giant Monsters. All out attack. May one day we'll do that. We'll have to bring on John LeMay. But yeah, if you guys are liking what we talk about, this is a little bit different than what we do, though we do a lot of prehistoric animals and a lot of movie or television show reviews. If you want to see more of those reviews, click that link to your left. For more about what we're doing here at Cools Paranormal, click that link to your right. And don't forget to hit that like and give us a subscribe. And switch that notification bar from personalized to all if you want to be notified on all of our upcoming videos. And let me know, if you're watching this, is there anyone that can comment that they actually watched it as a kid as well? Let me know in the comments below.